tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Do you and your brain ever feel at odds? Like, you know what you should be doing, but your brain isn't going along for the ride with you? Or how about those racing thoughts that keep you up at night when all you want to do is get some rest? Don't you wish your brain would work for you instead of against you? We all do, folks. And that's why we all need online therapy from our good friends at BetterHelp. With a dedicated therapist from BetterHelp, you'll sort out those racing thoughts, regain control of your life, and rekindle that long-lost friendship with your brain, all without setting foot in an office. BetterHelp is done entirely online and over the phone. If therapy has crossed your mind but seemed like too much of a hassle, I've got great news for you. BetterHelp is convenient, comfortable, suited to your schedule, and easy on the wallet. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. For dark nights. Good evening, listener, and happy Halloween's Eve. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Justine Anastasia, and if you're wondering who I am, well, I'm not just the rightful winner of Chilling Tales 2018 Evil Idol voice acting competition and the reigning queen of horror. I'm also, as of this past weekend, the new host of this show. What happened to little old Steve, you're asking? Well, if you didn't hear this past Saturday, you can go ahead and check out my little <laughs> bonus episode on our feed. In that episode, I broke more than the fourth wall, and the four previous Evil Idol champions just couldn't take the heat. And as for Steve Taylor, well, Steve had a, shall we say, incident and ran into the business end of a knife. I might have had something to do with it, or a lot to do with it, but let's not worry ourselves sick over minute details, shall we? <laughs> this is the sort of thing it takes to survive and move up in this business. It's a real cutthroat industry. <laughs> when life hands you lemons, or whoever screwed you out of a well-deserved victory, I believe you should first stab whoever gave you the lemons, and then make lemonade using the bones of your enemies as stirring sticks. But that's just me. On tonight's edition of our program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with two audio adaptations of frightening fiction about immortal ideation and regretful rule-breaking just in time for Halloween, and with an extra special ingredient tossed into this year's Witch's Brew, I've not just replaced Steve as the host, but I've decided to remake the show in my image. And that means all women all night long. So if you're into femme fatales, tonight's show is bound to check all your boxes. Tonight, I'm your host, Justine Anastasia, 
and this evening I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Ashley Fontaine and Kitty Olsen is a star-studded cast of the feminine persuasion, including yours truly, Michelle Kane, Heather Thomas, Rissa Montanez, Danielle Hewitt, Melissa Medina, and Olivia Steele. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights, turn on the dark, and say goodbye to your Y chromosomes. Our first tale this evening is written by Ashley Fontaine and is performed by Michelle Kane and Heather Thomas. Unmarried, childless, and now menopausal, Claire Renee Foster is nothing more than the frumpy lackey of social media icon Barbara O'Malley, a stunning beauty and a worldwide phenomenon known for showing the sisterhood of women over 40 to embrace the changes naturally with grace and dignity. Claire's jealousy reaches a fever pitch, and when the opportunity presents itself to extricate herself from the shackles of servitude, she will do anything to achieve freedom and eternal beauty. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Eternal Beauty. Claire awakens from the dream, sheets and nightgown soaked. Yanking the covers off, she rushes into the bathroom and throws cold water onto her face to help stem the hot flash, but it doesn't work. She fumbles down the dark hallway and into the kitchen, opens the freezer door, and shoves her head inside, sucking in the frigid air, relishing the cold against her damp, clammy skin. The refrigerator beeps an annoying warning. The door's been open too long. She snatches a handful of ice cubes and shuts it, just as Barbara steps into the kitchen and flicks on the light. Claire frowns. A wave of jealousy slams into her chest. Embarrassed by her appearance, shorter stature, disheveled hair, unpainted face, and cellulite. Both women are knocking hard on Sixty's door, and Claire looks it, but Barbara doesn't look a day over 30. The silk long floral robe in vibrant crimson caresses the highly sought-after influencer's impeccable body. She's worked for the woman for a decade and knows Barbara's never used injectables or felt the slice of a surgeon's knife. It's 2.30 in the morning, yet Barbara looks like she just stepped out of a salon. Not one auburn hair out of place. Makeup flawless, as always. And no creases on her skin from a pillowcase or rolling around. Which means her boss was recording another video for Claire to edit. Even without a connection to the outside world and all the millions of adoring fans around the globe, she's so addicted to seeing herself on camera, she cannot put the phone down. How pathetic. And considering Claire's plans, a waste of time. Ah, yes. Unmarried, childless, and now menopausal, Claire Renee Foster is nothing more than the frumpy lackey of social media icon, Barbara O'Malley. The stunning beauty is a worldwide phenomenon, known for showing the sisterhood of women over 40 to embrace the changes naturally, with grace and dignity. And her $99.95 per month homeopathic hormonal replacement therapy elixir subscription, a cash cow that allows her to live a lavish lifestyle that Claire runs. Good times. Not. Barbara flashes a dazzling white smile while floating past her and retrieves a mug from the cabinet. Here, you're dripping all over the hardwood. I'd hate for you to slip and fall since we're in the middle of nowhere. Miles and miles from civilization. And you know I don't drive. One mishap could turn into disaster. And I cannot function or run this empire without my tech guru and BFF. A wave of heat flushes up from her chest to cheeks, 
while grabbing a dish towel and wiping up the water. Sorry. These freaking hot flashes will be the death of me. It feels like I'll spontaneously combust any second, plus the hormonal changes have caused hair loss, weight gain, mood swings, dry skin, and terrifying nightmares. I'm so over them all. I'd hope being here in the mountains during the cold winter would have at least slowed them down. But they are relentless. I just ruined our vacation to rest and regroup after a stressful year. No, you didn't. We both needed a break, and this cabin and the remote location you chose are perfect. No cell service and no distractions from a phone constantly dinging. A time for inner reflection and reconnection with the Earth and universe. And that is exactly what we're doing. You know I preach women cannot run from menopausal symptoms. They must outsmart them. Oh, sweetie, I'm sorry. This is what, the sixth one in three days? Claire nods. Barbara's jade green gaze sweeps over her, and she feels violated by the probing stare. My career spawned when I stopped those things in their tracks after the first one dared to rear its ugly head. My elixir created this face and body, which pays the bills and allows me to live my truth. Are you ready to try it now? It's high time you did so your true inner beauty shines through and regenerates the outer degeneration. Then you can get in front of the camera with me rather than behind it. Can you imagine how my followers will react when they see the changes in someone like them? Say the magic word and I'll prepare us a fresh batch. And then you can kiss the symptoms of aging goodbye. Claire hides the irritation from her face and laughs nervously while crunching on an ice cube. She's helped prepare the magic elixir for years and knows it doesn't work, which is why she takes real medication prescribed by a doctor. Of course, that isn't working either and is the reason she sought out another avenue. Yes, because at this point... I drink deer urine if it would help. Sit. I'll be done in a flash. Oops, <laughs> bad word choice. Barbara chuckles while motioning toward the living room, her cherry red nails shimmering underneath the lights as she flicks her wrist. You know, I've learned over the years our dreams are merely repressed, unconscious longings driven by what we desire but are too afraid to embrace. If you trust me enough to share the details, perhaps we can figure out what you need to be fulfilled and live your best life, like me. If she hears that inane expression one more time, her brain will explode. Uh, I don't know. It was quite scary. Fears are nothing more than a state of mind. I remember reading that in a book, although it was so long ago, I can't recall which one, but the phrase became my personal mantra and changed my life. Gave me the courage to overcome every single stumbling block I've encountered, which have been many, including aging. I'm so tired of watching you suffer when I'm able to help you because your issues affect your work performance and my followers expect nothing but perfection from their idol. Spill, I'm all ears. While Barbara piddles around the remote rental cabin's kitchen, preparing what Claire secretly named Witch's Brew, a concoction of herbs and various teas, Claire settles into the cool leather couch carefully holding her hand in front of her lips to hide a smile. It's showtime. The book said it will work if all the steps are followed in the correct order, just like the dream. Please let it work. I cannot stand living another day trapped inside this failing body. I'm in the forest at night. A thick tangle of pine, maple, and oak trees are overhead, creating a living canopy. The moon's silvery rays filter through, guiding me while I walk on a twisted path, unsure of where I'm going, yet unable to ignore the urge to continue forward. I'm dressed in a long red robe, dragging across the damp ground, and since someone is beside me, 
yet cannot see anyone. The weirdest thing is, there's no sound. Not one insect, animal, or even my footsteps. Oh, that is interesting. No sound or voice in a dream means you feel powerless, misunderstood, or insecure. Go on. Yes, powerless and insecure. That's certainly me. But not for much longer. The book showed me a way out. I just need to get you to say the words. Claire muses silently before continuing. I find myself in a clearing, inches away from a large slab of stone shaped like a dinner table in the middle. Rhythmic chanting fills the forest, like Mother Earth is leading the sisterhood of the forest in an orchestra, just for me. Loud music or sounds are indicators you should increase your awareness level and pay attention to what is going on around you in life. Got it. Continue, please. I'm swaying in harmony with the sound, compelled by this intense energy exuding from what I suspect is a blood-stained altar. The clouds above part, and the moon's tendrils illuminate the glen, and the presence I felt earlier glides across the ground until in front of the stone, robe-clad arms outstretched toward the vibrant moon. A melodic female voice speaks in a language I don't understand, but immediately sense, consists of incantations or prayers or supplication. The thick stone turns this weird crimson color and pulsates, like a heartbeat. Red! The color of aggressive forces or great passion and emotional power. Or maybe blood, the source of all life. You desire to overcome your insecurities and the universe is guiding you toward finding your inner passion and power. Now we're getting somewhere. Barbara gushes. Oh yes, we are. Almost there. Damn, this is so exciting. All the lost sleep learning Latin will finally pay off. I'm frightened yet mesmerized by the ethereal pull of the throbbing stone. The rope flitters to the ground, and the body partially turns toward me, and sure enough, a woman with long auburn hair, like yours, looks at me, but she's pregnant, and the most beautiful human being I've ever seen. Sounds just like me, except the pregnant part. Our bodies are temples, but sadly the universe never afforded us the opportunity to experience motherhood. Yet another bond we share. Barbara sighs. You've never had a child because the men drawn to your beauty end up recoiling in horror when they realize you are the most self-absorbed narcissist on the planet. The eggs inside me refuse to create offspring with any of the few ugly men I let touch me. I cannot wait to seek out hunks and ride them until spent without the fear of pregnancy. Her pulse quickens. She's reached the point of no return in the story and must steer Barbara in the right direction. The woman mounts the stone and stretches out, body covering the glowing rock. An ancient silver dagger appears in her hand, slender fingers clasped around the bone-encrusted handle. Oh, now we're cooking. I'm getting a... Killing off the old so the new can emerge vibe here. Anything else? Yes, that's what I thought too. And it scared me. She looks at me and speaks before plunging the knife into her heart. But that's where it ends. The worst part is, I don't understand what she said. Barbara is pouring steaming water into two mugs and immediately pauses. Do you recognize what language it is? No, but it is very beautiful. Lyrical. Think, Claire. This might be the key to unlocking the dream. Do you recall enough to repeat it? Claire's mouth is dry as excitement floods her body. She nods, forcing herself to enunciate properly what she's rehearsed ever since finding the spellbook at an obscure occult shop in Los Angeles. Hunk. Oblationum. Spontanea, voluntate, facio et apertis, accus in hunc sanguinum ineo. Barbara's eyes widen. 
That's Latin. Even from across the room, Claire can see Barbara's face and arms turn ghostly pale. She forces herself to sound shocked. Really? Do you know what it means? I'm a little rusty, but yes, I think so. She said, I make this offering of my own free will, and with open eyes I enter into this blood pact. Claire fights the urge to leap from the couch and jump for joy. She said it. Hallelujah. It has begun. Soon I'll have what's rightfully mine, and my worries about looks, men, money, and aging will be over. Whew, there's a lot going on inside of your head, sweetie. It might take some time to fully comprehend it all. Oh, dang. This bottle of black cohosh doesn't have enough for both of us. Hang on, and I'll get some from my purse, and then we can start the process of figuring out the best plan of action to address your worries. Barbara struts down the hallway, just exactly like Claire envisioned when planning this moment. On silent feet, she pads into the kitchen, snatches the jimson weed she picked and dried earlier from her purse, and deposits the exact amount of dollops into Barbara's vibrant red mug, plastered with her logo. She's sweating profusely with nervous energy by the time she makes it back to the couch, seconds before Barbara returns. The final piece de resistance needed to vanquish the effects of aging. Barbara stirs a tablespoonful into each mug before entering the living room. She hands the black one to Claire. To the sisterhood of women and the inner strength and determination to face and conquer what frightens us, including the sands of time. Amen, Claire cheers, followed by several sips of the fragrant brew, watching eagerly over the rim as Barbara downs the entire contents of the mug in one large gulp. The book said to wait 15 minutes for it to take effect. Keep talking. Keep her occupied until she's pliable, before leading her out into the woods to begin the blood ritual. Soon we will switch bodies and trade lives. Well, hers will end in this wretched flesh after having a tragic accident, but mine will be glorious in hers. It's happening. It's really happening. Huh. Interesting. This batch tasted different. I wonder why. Maybe the black cohosh was old? Oh my. Something's wrong. The mug slips from Barbara's hands, shattering upon impact with the hardwood. Claire's body shudders with excitement, even though she's shocked it's happening so fast. Barbara smiles and Claire's hair stands on end. No, that's not it. I detect something familiar. Oh, yes. Belladonna, also known as Jimson Weed. Right, sweetie? Claire is dumbfounded. How in the world does she know? Why does her voice sound so different? So ominous? and with a hint of a southern accent. A wave of heat flushes her skin, surging up from her neck all the way to her ears. Her entire body trembles and vision blurs. She tries to move her legs, but they remain frozen in place. You studied hard, bestie. Though I must admit, taking the bait hurt me. Out of all the women who've worked for me over the centuries... Whom I've introduced to the book, you were the only one I considered a friend and true sister. Claire, we had so much in common. I wanted us to find a suitable sacrifice together, and believe it or not, planned on allowing you to partake in the benefits once we did. But unfortunately for you, that is not to be. I had high hopes you'd be strong and fight the temptation to covet all that I am. But I was wrong. It takes great effort for Claire to form words. Her tongue is thick. Centuries. I don't understand. 
No, I'm sure you do not, as the poison courses through your veins that I slipped in rather than the black cohosh. Here's a quick and simple explanation. I'm a lot older than I look, and I'm quite tech-savvy. Have access to all your internet search history. Discovered your friendship and loyalty were just facades after reading countless private messages and discovering your interest in the occult. So I sent you to pick up herbs and spices at the store instead of ordering them online. Lirio's occult shop was right next door, and sure enough, you entered and bought the spellbook and went right to the section created for me. Claire's palms are clammy and her heart thunders inside her sweaty chest. Your spell? Yes, created by me and my mother a long time ago. About three miles from this cabin. In my day, women who were beautiful, intelligent, and had strong intuition were burned alive. I watched in horror as it happened to several innocent young ladies, each one wrongfully accused by jealous women or lustful men. And my mother told me as I moved closer and closer to adulthood, my time would come. She was right. So we prepared accordingly at night when everyone else slept. Claire's throat feels like she's swallowed bleach. It is so confusing to me, and I will never understand why women don't support their sisters. Tragic. I've only encountered a few who overcame their own insecurities. Most secretly hate anyone they feel pose as a threat, whether it is physical beauty financial stability, or a gaggle of offspring with the man they had their sights set on. I've waited a long time to experience a change, but women are still backstabbing harpies with no redeemable qualities. Trust me, I know from years of interactions. Superstition, fear, and jealousy, those three combined were my downfall. On a cold winter's evening, when the men came with torches to my father's home. All because two hussies told their parents I put a hex on them. When they were caught naked with their legs in the air and young men grinding on top of them in a barn. The tale was a lie, but I did possess the ability to do such magic. Until the moment the pyre was ignited. So my fate was sealed even though I had done no wrong. Claire's mind is spinning at a frantic pace. I never screamed, not one time, because I refused to give the inhumane creatures surrounding me the satisfaction of hearing my pain. Instead, just like Mama and I planned, I reached out inside my mind to the universe and spoke the exact same words you did earlier in left. Eternal life and exquisite beauty was granted to me for a price, which must be paid by sacrifice every ten years. During the final seconds of my life, everything went black, and then I found myself watching my body burn from a place in the trees. Each decade when the sacrifice is offered, The hands of time are reversed 30 years for me, and I may remain in my original form or take over one of the sacrifice. But in nearly 400 years, I haven't found one who compares to my beauty. I need your life force to regenerate. Such a tragic choice on my end. I let my guard down with you and thought I might enjoy the companionship of a good friend. But your actions proved, once again, that friendship is overrated and impossible in self-centered generation. Claire's stomach rolls as the liquid burns her insides. Barbara removes the red silk robe, and another is underneath. She places the first, which is still warm, onto Claire's body. Her jade green eyes glow with hatred, yet she's still smiling. Belladonna is a strong hallucinogenic drug used in various pagan religious ceremonies for centuries. But of course, you already knew that. 
just like you knew it grows wild here in the Kentucky Hills, even during winter. You begged me to vacation here, but only after noticing me looking at cabins online, which I did on purpose. I must come here because it's where I've held the ceremony for centuries. I don't make the rules of the universe. I just follow them. I'm immune to Belladonna. You are not. All I needed was for you to speak the oath in Latin, so it's all good. You tricked me. Terror wells up inside Claire's throat. She tries forcing her muscles to obey the command to run, but nothing happens. Don't panic. This is just a hallucination or a dream. It isn't happening. Barbara's sinister laughter fills the cabin as her cold fingers grasp Claire's arm, steering her towards the door. And you plan on killing me, so let's call the evening a draw. Oh, don't look so scared, sweetie. It'll be over soon, I promise. You know, I'm surprised you didn't notice the odor of the belladonna in your elixir. Some humans believe belladonna expands the mind opening it up to new possibilities and avenues to connect to the universe with, which is possible. In your case, as well as all the others, I use it as a form of mind control. Dealing with irrational females drives me crazy. The pressure from Barbara's strong grip around Claire's arm intensifies. A strange whooshing sound thrums inside her head, and she sees Barbara's lips move but cannot hear anything. Her head suddenly feels heavy, and she's desperate to run, yet still unable to move. And suddenly, ebony darkness descends. Claire's eyes flutter open and soul-crushing panic seizes her chest. She immediately realizes she's in the glen from her dreams, the stone slab glowing brightly, bathing the entire area in blood red. Barbara stands over her, sheds her robe, and uses the dagger to slice off the one covering Claire's trembling body. Red glints off the tips of her nails, and her face contorts, elongating the once beautiful jade green orbs into thin red slits, cheeks and forehead morphing into an unrecognizable mass of flesh with thin translucent skin pulsating with each heartbeat. The silvery blade sparkles in the reddish glow seeping from the rock underneath her body. Her fingers tingle and burn when Barbara places the dagger into her right hand. She wants to stab her nemesis or throw it away, but cannot stop herself from raising it high above her breasts. Please don't make me do this. I'm begging you. I'm sorry for what I thought about doing, I swear. You're right. I was jealous of you, but I've seen the error of my ways and I'll change, I promise. We'll find you someone else. I'll stay by your side, worship you, anything you want. But please, don't make me kill myself. I don't want to die. Oh, it's too late for false apologies. Barbara's lips curl into a feral snarl. And trust me, I didn't want to be burned alive centuries ago. Nor did I want to die tonight. So I promise to live out my best life with the years your death grants me. Unable to force herself to stop, the dagger plunges into her chest. Claire's piercing wail reverberates throughout the quiet holler. A shimmering gray mist bursts from her mouth and nose, writhing in strange arcs above her head. The pain is overshadowed by bone-crushing cold. Barbara picks up the dagger and licks the sharp edge while inhaling what she now realizes is her life force. Too bad you learned such important lessons about being careful what you put out into the universe and whose life you covet. One just never knows who is really behind a media juggernaut, right? <laughs> Many thanks for the years, sweetie. 
I'll make sure to tag you in an amazing tribute to my BFF online, whose eternal beauty will never fade. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by BetterHelp. Why is it, I, I wonder, that our own brains seem at odds with us? Is it too much to ask that I act in my own best interest? I'm as a wholesome a guy as you can imagine, but my brain is an insatiable deviant. I make every effort to get to bed early, but my brain wants to party like Motley Crew. I'm a loyal husband and a family man, but my brain's eyes are wandering all over the place. And why is that? Because sometimes our brains are not our friends. You know who are, though? Our friends at BetterHelp Online Therapy. Talk therapy is the best way to sort out your thoughts and get you and your brain on the same page. We've all got issues to deal with. Everything from anxiety and depression to the sheer stress of everyday life. Between all that and those racing thoughts bouncing around in your head, a little therapy can go a long way. And BetterHelp is simply the best way to get it. BetterHelp is done completely online and over the phone. So you get the treatment you need without all the hassle. It's flexible, convenient, and more affordable than ever. Even getting started is easy. Just visit betterhelp.com chilling. Fill out their online questionnaire, and in as few as 48 hours, you'll be matched with the perfect candidate. Not only will you get weekly video or phone chats, but you'll also be able to text your therapist anytime. That alone is worth the price of admission, folks. The minute that brain of yours starts acting up, you've got the support you need right there in your pocket. I'm a big proponent of better help, and I'll tell you why. Research studies and clinical trials have proven the effectiveness of talk therapy, and with better help, those benefits are more accessible than ever. See, therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back so you can work for yourself instead of against yourself. And that's something we can all benefit from. Check out the testimonials on their website sometime. They've done a lot of people a lot of good, and there's no reason you can't be next. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash chilling today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chilling. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed Eternal Beauty, as written by Ashley Fontaine and performed by Michelle Kane and Heather Thomas. Award-winning, an international best-selling author, Ashley Fontaine, enjoys stories that immerse the reader deep into the human psyche and the monsters lurking within each of us. She writes in numerous genres including mystery, suspense, horror, sci-fi, and sometimes poetry. To learn more about her books, please visit www.ashleyfontaine.net. That's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, Fontaine, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-N-E dot net. You can hear more of Michelle Kane and Heather Thomas right here on our very own network, as well as over on the Creepy Podcast at creepypodcast.com. Don't forget to tell them Justine from Chilling Tales for Dark Nights sent you, and that they have far too few ladies on their roster. <laughs> our second tale of the evening is written by Kitty Olson, and is performed by yours truly, Justine Anastasia, alongside Rissa Montanez, Danielle Hewitt, Melissa Medina, and Olivia Steele. In it, a visit to a tarot reader goes awry when someone breaks one of the most important rules. Don't wake up her mother. So, without any further ado, I present to you, Don't Wake Mother. Come. 
Come on, Sienna, hurry up! I'm gonna get drenched if I stay out here. Even with the threat of getting soaked in ice-cold rain, I did not want to get out of the car. I didn't even want to go out tonight. My plans were to play Baldur's Gate 3 and do absolutely fuck all else. But Poppy, bless her heart, did not accept my plans and just gave me the puppy dog eyes. I can't say no to my best friend, even if what we were doing was, in my humble opinion, dumb as hell. Don't get me wrong, I love Poppy. I've known her since we were babies. Literal, lifelong friendship. But where I was focused on what I could see and touch and verify as real, she had not, to put it lightly. When we were 13, she proudly announced she was now a Wiccan and could communicate with the goddess and the horned god. She dropped Wicca after about three months, but other things came and went during that time too. Crystal healing, pendulums, spells, witchcraft unrelated to Wicca, psychics, and of course, tarot cards. She was back on the tarot train this month. It doesn't bother me either way. It was what made her happy. I thought it was all bullcrap, but she'd never actually done something that would be harmful, like using amethyst to cure cancer or whatever. In return, she never pushed me to believe in the metaphysical. Never pushed, but she did invite me along to talk with her psychics. Sometimes, you go along with your friends' plans that don't sound that fun just to spend time with them. And I had spent a lot of time in my apartment lately. So, I agreed to this plan. Now, outside the house, I was having second thoughts. It wasn't like the house had a spooky vibe. It was a bit older, but it was in good condition. It was out in the middle of fucking nowhere, though. The nearest neighbor was a farmhouse probably a half mile out, and there was nothing else out here but cornfields and small patches of woods. Sienna, do I need to drag you out of there? Oh, I'm freezing. No more delays. I took a deep breath and popped out of the car, immediately regretting my decision not to bring a coat. Poppy had brought her obnoxiously pink and red raincoat that somehow came in sizes for adults. But wherever the coat did not protect, she was soaking wet. Come on! She looped her arm in with mine and dragged me to the front gate. She quickly undid it before she pressed a finger to her lips. Don't make too much noise. We don't want to set off the dog. Even in the mostly dark, I could see it was well kept. A small garden was in front of the large bay window, and flowers surrounded the birch tree. I could see the doghouse. I could not see the dog until we were almost at the door. The only reason I saw it was because its eyes opened as we got to the door. Its fur was pitch black. Poppy quietly knocked, and we waited for a few moments before I saw someone behind the glass of the door. The woman who opened it was the last kind of person I could have expected. Most of the time, Poppy dragged me to readings. The host was older, all gaudy jewelry and reeking of incense. The woman on the other side of the door was no older than us, wearing yellow, elbow-high rubber gloves, a green headband, and a rubber apron. Oh, I lost track of time. I'm sorry, Poppy. I was busy cleaning. The woman pushed a few strands of black hair back past her headbands. Come on in. Make yourselves cozy in the reading room. But try to be quiet. Mother's asleep and I don't want her woken up. Oh, you must be her friend. I'm Vanessa. Please take your shoes off. I just cleaned the rugs this afternoon and I don't want them getting all wet. I'm Sienna, I managed to say before Vanessa whisked herself away. I glanced over at Poppy, who was grinning ear to ear, and I finally understood why she insisted I meet her new tarot card reader. Are you serious? <laughs> She's your type. Poppy giggled as she kicked her shoes off. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if she's gay, but she's got black hair. She's super neat. She, um... Don't you start, Poppy. I threatened as I unlaced my boots. For real. Do not start. I had just ended a relationship. I was not eager to jump into another one, even if Poppy was. Poppy stuck her tongue out and then beckoned me into another room. This was a bit more what I expected. Comfy couches, a low table with a deck of tarot cards spread across it, statues of various gods and goddesses on the shelves along with crystal balls and long sheer curtains hanging over the doorways. The cat was a welcome change of pace, though. A tuxedo Maine Coon that was lounging in a fluffy bed. Poppy plopped down on one of the couches and I sat next to her. 
The cat looked unimpressed at our intrusion and just yawned before going back to sleep. Vanessa joined us in a few minutes, rubber gloves and apron discarded and carrying a teapot. Thank you for being patient. I just got into a cleaning mood and before I knew it, you were at the door. She laughed quietly before taking the couch across from us. Do you want me to use your favorite deck, Poppy? And what deck would you prefer I use for you, Sienna? Before Poppy could respond, I blurted out, I'm just here to be company. I don't believe in tarot. Poppy looked horrified at my bluntness, but Vanessa just quietly giggled as she poured three cups of tea. Oh, I'm sorry for assuming. That's perfectly fine. The cards don't really work for people that don't have a bit of faith in them. Other than that, it's just for fun. You can pet Oreo while I do the reading for Poppy. Meanwhile, Vanessa shuffled a deck of cards and started the reading. There was no pitch, no mystical wind-up. It was quite matter-of-fact how Vanessa went through it, more like a friend giving advice than calling on the powers of the universe to solve your problems. I'm so glad you got that promotion at work. You really deserved it. Be mindful, though. Not everyone will have your best interests at heart. I know you're such a sweetheart, but just because that older guy in your department acts sweet and mentor-like, best give him a wide berth. He's not trustworthy and is just going to hold you back. No, this isn't the time for boyfriend hunting. You really need to focus on yourself right now, and your career. Building a life with someone else is much easier when you've made a good foundation with yourself. You're only 23. There's no hurry. I found myself back on the couch before I knew it, enjoying that mint tea Vanessa had poured for us. Poppy drunk down her every word, eyes wide and occasionally nodding as Vanessa spoke. The reading ended with Vanessa patting Poppy on the shoulder. Thanks for coming tonight. The rain's still coming down really hard. If you want to wait for it to peter out a bit, I'll get some cookies if you promise to still keep being quiet. Can you do a reading for me? I didn't even mean to say it. It just popped out. Maybe it's because Vanessa's cute. Maybe because her reading style was genuinely more interesting to me. But now I wanted to see what she had to say about me. Poppy's jaw dropped, but Vanessa only slightly raised her eyebrows. Well, if you'd like to... I'll choose the deck, though, if you're sure. I nodded and watched as Vanessa pulled out a decently sized wooden box from underneath her couch. Inside were packs and packs of different tarot cards, some more traditional, some more goofy and fun. Vanessa traced her fingers over the packs before she selected one that was pale blue with minimalist pictures in gold filigree. Poppy gasped quietly. <gasps> oh, I haven't seen that deck before, she said. It's a new one. You'll be the first I use it for, Sienna. I don't know why that felt so flattering, but it did. Vanessa shuffled the deck, her face one of utmost concentration as the cards were mixed together. First card she set down was a little guy holding a pentacle. So, this is definitely meant to be you. Good. That's a place I can work from. Is there any particular questions you want to ask? I shook my head. Then let's just see what advice the cards have for you today. The second card she turned over, and I shit you not, was literally death. The little golden grim reaper was almost cute in this style, but I did burst out laughing. Seriously? I asked, cocking an eyebrow. Vanessa didn't seem insulted by my incredulity. She actually seemed to find it funny. Seriously? This isn't a bad thing. Despite common superstition, this card doesn't talk about actual death. This is all about change. Change is a crucial part of our lives. If things don't change, we stagnate and rot. Just prepare yourself for it. Things end, but new things will begin. She set the card down and went to pick up another one. But the card she picked accidentally took another one with it. The second card fell onto the table, turning so it was upside down. The Page of Swords. Oh, that's interesting. Vanessa set down the next card, Ten of Swords. She paused for a moment, pursing her lips as she clearly considered the meaning of those two. I knew I was drawn to use this deck of cards for a reason. So I'm going to ask you, does the color blue and the time 1111 have any significance for you? Before I could answer, there was a screech of tires and a loud crash outside. I sprang to my feet and was going to head to the door when it slammed open. Vanessa visibly flinched and the color drained from her cheeks. Oh no. 
she whispered before also getting up. You should go. This isn't going to end well. Vanessa, you fucking bitch! The woman who joined us was furious. Her face flushed crimson and each footstep taken was a stomp. Vanessa held up both her hands. Please, Becky, quiet down. Mother is sleeping. Shut up! A nerve was now popping out in Becky's forehead. I can't believe you. I'm one of your most loyal clients. I brought you so much business. And how do you repay me? You make my boyfriend dump me! Vanessa swallowed, nervously lacing and unlacing her fingers again. I I didn't make him do anything, I swear. You need to be quiet. If you wake Mother up, she is going to be furious. Yeah, yeah, you're just jealous I have a man and you're going to be a lonely old cat lady your whole life! Becky sneered at Vanessa, who just shrunk and looked like she wanted to be literally anywhere else. Becky stepped forward and raised her fist like she wanted to punch her. Well, what are you going to do to make this right? I had had more than enough of this chick. I stepped between her and Vanessa, holding up a hand. Hey, she doesn't owe you shit. She told you to shut up, so use your one brain to shut your mouth. Becky seemed to just notice I was even there, and the way she looked over me, she clearly didn't like the look of me. I was half expecting the next word to come out of her mouth to be something incredibly offensive when the loudest voice yet boomed through the house. Who's making all that racket in my home? I thought the source of the shout had to be stomping down the stairs, But when she turned the corner, I realized quite quickly that that was just because this woman was an actual fucking giant. Standing well over six feet tall and with a broad build to match, the elderly woman's wrinkled face was undeniably crone-like, thinning white hair sticking out from her liver-spotted scalp and a large wart on one of her sunken cheeks. The image was finished off by the fact that she was wearing one of those old granny nightgowns, flowy and white with cornflowers printed on it. Vanessa audibly gulped. Mother, I'm sorry. I was just doing a reading for these two when Rebecca came barging in. She was just leaving. Becky snapped out of her shock of Mother's sudden appearance. I am not! I'm not leaving until you call my boyfriend and tell him your reading was bogus! Mother snorted like a hog and crossed the room in a few strides. Now towering over Becky, she tilted her head to the side, and I couldn't help but be reminded of a hawk looking down at a mouse. You mean that reading she gave to that skinny wimp a few days ago? Oh no, it was a good one. She told that he needed to dump your venomous ass on the curb with the rest of the garbage. Vanessa looked horrified. I didn't say that, she yelped. I'm paraphrasing. Mother smirked down at Becky, and I got a glimpse of a golden tooth in her predatory grin. You're a nasty, selfish bitch who makes everyone around her worse. I can only think of one use for you. Becky's jaw hung lower and lower at each of Mother's hurled insults. How dare you! Mother's hands clamped around her neck before Becky could finish her sentence. I froze. I couldn't scream, run, or try to help free Becky. I just stood there as Mother's hands squeezed tight. Becky's eyes popped wide open and she clawed uselessly at Mother's arms. The hag just continued to smirk. I don't know exactly when the elderly woman started growing. I do remember feeling small in her presence, but it wasn't until Mother's head brushed the ceiling that my brain caught up to what I was seeing. The elderly woman had sprouted over two more feet in height. It was insane. It was so fucking insane, and I still didn't do a thing. Not even when I saw Mother's nails stab into Becky's neck, each claw-like finger now dripping blood. I don't know how long she strangled Becky. It felt like hours. But Becky's gasps and gurgles became quiet. Her struggling grew weaker and slower, and finally she went limp. Her face a shade of purple I'd never seen in a human. Mother finally let go of Becky and she fell to the ground with a smack. Not even a twitch. Becky was dead. The room was dead quiet while Mother examined her claws. Genuine claws, not just sharp nails. And sighed, wiping them off on her nightgown. Her beady, black eyes turned to me. I had to be next. I was so screwed. (sighs) 
Well, the body's just gonna go to waste if we stand around. Time to get to work. Poppy had also frozen, but that sentence was what kicked her instincts back into drive. She screamed and ran for it. Unfortunately, her path took her right by Mother, and in a blur of movement, the giant hag had backhanded Poppy hard enough to send her sprawling on the floor. <clears throat> Vanessa, dear, put this scaredy cat in the back room. Huh? What? Uh, no! <coughs> no, don't pout. I'm not gonna kill her, too. Just lock her in until I decide what she can be good for. Well, don't just stand there, other girl. Grab the bitch and drag her into the kitchen. I couldn't believe what she was saying, let alone what I did next. I did exactly what I was told to do. I hooked my arms underneath the corpse's armpits and dragged her along, following the chuckling crone as we left the reading room. I heard Poppy asking what we were doing. We needed to get out of there. We needed to call the cops. But I let her voice fade into the background of white noise in my skull. The kitchen was nothing out of the ordinary, save for the giant butcher slab that was up against the right wall. Mother nodded to the slab. Get her up there. It was not a request. It was an order. It was a struggle lifting the body entirely off the ground, but with a bit of shoving and a loud smack, Becky's corpse was now lying on the butcher block. Mother gave me a long look up and down before grinning proudly. Good girl. What's your name? Sienna? I took a nervous step back. What are you going to do with her? <laughs> what do you think I'm going to do? Mother snorted again. Give you a proper reading, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, those cards are cute little gimmicks, and my darling Vanessa can use them efficiently as one can. But she needs to grow up. Tarot cards are child's play. Andropomancy. Now that's how you get real knowledge of things unknown. Depending on the results, I might try some osteomancy as well. We'll see. Those words meant absolutely nothing to me. Even when Mother shredded Becky's bright blue tank top off her body and pulled a large knife off a rack, I didn't get it. Not until she plunged that knife into Becky's gut and sliced her open. Her innards slipped free, flopping onto the ground with a sickening splat. I stared in horror as Mother stared at them, murmuring quietly to herself as she saw something I couldn't even possibly comprehend. The room was quiet, save for the sound of more of Becky's intestines sliding out. Finally, Mother grunted before slamming the body back down on the slab. <clears throat> We're quite alike, you and I. She said so matter-of-factly, I almost burst out laughing. It was so absurd how calm she was now, compared to her fiery rage when she'd first been woken up. You don't take other people's word for it. You need proof. <laughs> no blind faith for you. I like that. I swallowed and tried to avoid breathing in through my nose. The smell of blood was about to bowl me over. You like that, I repeated. Hmm, yes. Now Mother took a different blade, and with the finesse of a butcher, started carving up Becky. Slabs of meat were laid to the side, while some prime cuts were literally thrown across the room into an open pot. Well, the reading was clear. I shouldn't let you get away. My heart nearly stopped out of fear when Mother looked up. She was now splattered with blood, which, paired with her granny nightgown, somehow made her more terrifying. She threw her head back and shrieked with laughter. <laughs> Not like that, girl. Oh, you're too much potential to just have for dinner. Mother proceeded to crack open Becky's ribs with her bare hands. She pulled free and held up the woman's heart. <clears throat> yes, that potential. <sighs> the readings are clear. Some people think you have to have your head in the clouds to make magic work. <clears throat> That's not true. You need to be grounded. You need to be... calm. What makes you think I'm any of those things? I blurted out. Mother grinned. You're not running away, are you? You helped carry this bitch to the table and stayed for your reading, didn't you? 
Oh, girl, you are something special. Mother hurled her fist back and threw the heart into the pot. <clears throat> Put the lid on. We'll be having a late dinner tonight. She croaked. I needed to stop. I needed to get out. Now. There were other knives in reach. I could get a weapon. I could defend myself. But instead, I crossed the room and, doing my best not to look into the pot, I popped the lid on. The moment I did that, the stove clicked on, small flames flickering underneath the pot. I turned and I hated how I was shocked by how fast Mother was carving up the body. The kind of speed that only came with experience. This wasn't Mother's first time butchering a human body. She pulled the ribs free, and then with a shout, she threw them across the floor. Right, so, here's what the bones advise. Mother said as she continued to carve up Becky. Don't quit your day job yet. You're gonna need the savings. Next month, we'll be starting your training. Few years, you could actually be an alright witch. I don't want to kill people, I said. Good. Then you won't fuck me over by getting caught red-handed. Mother waggled her blood-soaked fingers in the air and cackled. Teaching the bloodthirsty is a great way to end up having to flee a mob. I should know. Vanessa poked her head into the kitchen and sighed as she looked down at the bones on the floor. Mother, you really should put down a tarp first. I'm going to have to mop again. She said, with the same amount of frustration one would have if someone walked on clean floors with dirty shoes. Mother scoffed. Don't tell me how to throw the bones, brat! Is that poppy girl locked up? Yes, Mother. I gave her some tea to help calm her. Good, good. Now, pick out a nice wine to pair with dinner. Mother shooed Vanessa away, the other woman avoiding eye contact with me as she headed down into a cellar. She sighed. Oh, my sweet dear Vanessa. I picked her too. I'm very good at picking witches. I don't want to be a witch, I said. You don't want to be a witch that relies on good vibes and listens to all that do-no-harm bull, Mother said, as if she knew my complaints were half-hearted. You want to have control of your life. Your fate is ready to be taken. It's just a reach away. I can give you that, Sienna. Now go set the table. The plates are in that cupboard there. Set three plates. I don't think Poppy's going to have an appetite. Once you're done, you can have a break. I obeyed her again. It wasn't like I didn't have a choice. I wasn't being mind-controlled. I just did what I was told. The plates were fine china, but the silverware had handles that felt like bone. I finally plopped down in one of the chairs and just stopped thinking for a while. I usually tended to lean towards overthinking, but right now I was just blank. I wasn't even sure what I was going to do when I heard Mother shout that dinner was ready. Numbly, I dragged myself out of the chair and headed for the stove. I flinched when I took off the lid, but when the steam cleared, what I saw was a proper-looking pot roast with potatoes and carrots. The meat didn't smell quite like beef, but it did smell delicious. My mouth watered, and that almost made me be sick into the pot. I put the lid back on. Don't drag your feet, lazy girl. Get the pot to the table. It's already past 11. Past 11? No fucking way. We'd not come that late in the evening, had we? I glanced up at the clock to confirm Mother wasn't pulling my leg. Vanessa finally reappeared, cradling the bottle of wine. Do you like red wine? She asked me quietly. I'm more of a vodka drinker, I admitted as I picked up the pot. That got a bit of a smile out of Vanessa, one that had just a hint of the darkness that Mother had in her smirks. Oh, you're gonna fit in here just fine, Sienna. The table set, Mother dished out our portions of the roast and passed out bread rolls. When you share a meal, you're establishing a relationship. We're beginning something beautiful here, Sienna. Control of your future. I stared down at my plate. Did I want this? Did I want to dive deeper down this rabbit hole? Did I want to finally have a bit of control over my life? I picked up my knife and fork and slowly cut a small piece of the meat. I brought it to my lips, hesitated for just a moment, and I took a bite. (laughs) 
I hope you enjoyed Don't Wake Mother, as written by Kitty Olson and performed by myself, Justine Anastasia, as well as Rissa Montanez, Danielle Hewitt, Melissa Medina, and Olivia Steele. Kitty, the odd cat lady Olson, is a young writer currently living in Illinois, but her heart always remains in Michigan. She's been writing since she was young, and over the past couple years has developed a knack for writing horror. A special thank you to all the ladies that helped make our program tonight possible, including the bevy of beautiful voice actresses that lent their talents to our retellings of tonight's tales, and of course, the two exceptionally talented women that penned the tales of terrors themselves. And of course, thank you to Steve and all the other gentlemen that gave their lives so that our ladies' night could go on unimpeded this evening just in time for Halloween. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, I do have to say that I wasn't able to eliminate all of our competition tonight. Regrettably, there are still other programs on the Simply Scary Podcast Network, hosted by men. You can hear Otis Gyrie over at Scary Stories Told in the Dark on Sunday nights, or Drew Blood, at Drew Blood's Dark Tales each Friday evening. If something more Midwestern interests you, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland comes to you each Wednesday. And, last but not least, the show formerly hosted by Eric Peabody, Horror Hill, is scheduled every Thursday. Uh, that said, Eric got in a little over his head this past weekend and bit off a little more than he could chew. As a result, he can't chew at all anymore, (laughs) or breathe, or, well, do anything other than feed the daisies. (sighs) I haven't the slightest idea how the show will go on. Tsk, tsk, whatever shall we do? (laughs) You'll have to tune in Thursday to find out. All of our shows can be found on our official YouTube channel, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, or on Spotify and wherever else podcasts can be found. And don't forget to sign up as a patron on our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. So, if you don't mind listening to a bunch of entitled, less talented men entertain you, go ahead and give those other shows a listen, while you still can. Because it's only a matter of time until I figure out where they live too. (laughs) Now, to take a page out of our beloved former host Steve's playbook, allow me to close tonight's program by saying, Our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to... I'd like to... Ugh! No! I gave the staff specific instructions not to interrupt me tonight. These idiots can't do anything right. Not so fast, Justine. Get your hands off my microphone. Steve? What are you doing here? You're supposed to be dead. Shouldn't your wife and kids be crying over a post-funeral buffet line in your honor right about now? The only thing dead tonight are your career aspirations. That's impossible! I killed you myself! I watched you die! No, you watched me bleed and walked away. But, uh, that wasn't your biggest mistake. Oh, really? What's my biggest mistake, you washed-up bag of bones? You should have gone for the head. No! This is my show! Mine! It's mine! No one insults the Queen and lives to tell about it. No one. Not even you. Ah! Stop right there. One more move, and you're going to lose way more than Evil Idol, Justine. You're about to lose your life. It ain't worth it. Just stop. It's over. Put your hands in the air, Miss Anastasia, and don't move. You're under arrest. 
for the attempted murder of Chilling Tales host Steve Taylor and the murders of Evil Idol winners Nick Goroff, Jonathan West, and Jesse Brown, and of Horror Hill host and Evil Idol's second place runner-up Eric Peabody. Put your hands behind your back. No! No, 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 no! I'll kill you! I'll kill all of you! I'm the queen! I'm the evil idol! And this is my show! Get your hands off me! Quiet down, ma'am. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. Fuck you! Goodbye, Justine. Your short-lived reign of terror is over. Let's see how many people are willing to bow to you in prison. <laughs> oh, I'll get you, Steve. Just you wait. I have my ways. I'll be back. You haven't seen the last of me! Get your hands off me! Do you know who I am? I'm the evil idol. I'm the queen! Well, that was certainly something you don't see every day. Happy Halloween, everyone! Looks like our friend Justine may have gotten a trick when she bargained for a treat. Ah, it's good to be back in the old saddle. And on this most auspicious of occasions, no less. Even though tonight's show was a bit different, thanks all the same for listening and joining us on the spookiest of nights. Before we go, I do want to tell you one last thing. As I mentioned this past Saturday, before Justine went bananas, Evil Idol Chilling Tales for Dark Knight's voice acting competition is back for 2023. That's right, Evil Idol Resurrection takes place this November. All jokes aside, we here at Chilling Tales for Dark Knights have an important announcement for you. It starts Monday, November 27th with a special twist. This year, we've left a spot in the competition open for one of our listeners with no prior voice acting experience to join the fray. To claim the lucky 13th position, what you need to do is send us an email by midnight central time on Sunday, November 12th and include a vocal recording of yourself explaining in two minutes or less why you should compete in this year's Evil Idol competition as our wildcard candidate. Along with a vocal recording, please include your name, phone number if applicable, your email address, a short written bio, and a headshot photograph suitable for use in your profile if you happen to be chosen. The subject line should read, Evil Idol Resurrection Wild Card Audition. The email should be sent to natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com. That's natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, at chillingtalesfordarknights.com. The production team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights will choose one contestant at random out of those interested and we will cover the cost to have you record at a local studio so that you can sound your very best when going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other voice talents in the competition. Not only that, but you'll be teamed up at absolutely no cost to you with one of the stellar authors on our team to craft a custom tale in collaboration that will highlight your talents and, if you so choose, incorporate your ideas. So, if you've been dying for an opportunity to be a part of our channel and podcasts, here's your chance. Don't miss your opportunity, the first in several years, to join our team and have your voice heard by thousands. And who knows, you might even win. Just, you know, if you do, keep an eye out for jealous runners-up from prior years that may want you dead. <laughs> Don't worry. You'll be fine. That's all for tonight, folks. As usual, I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure to lead this program for so many years and to share this Halloween Eve with you. 
tune in again next week when we get things back to normal around here. And once again, turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.